people with depression. It's something that, that, that will happen from time to time. But it's whether we choose to remain in that state or choose to ask God to guide us to victory and give us the victory over depression. Um, we also saw that this is not by any means a physical study, but rather uh, spirit, we're dealing with the spiritual aspects of uh, depression. And we also... Uh, who can tell me one of the two de lies of depression? Just by raising your hand, you can raise your hand or call it out. There's no hope. Correct. That is that is the second. That was the second one. And um, and we can. You're alone. Correct. Very good. Very good, guys. Uh, so there are two lies of depression. One is that I'm alone, and just just reminding that uh, if you know Christ as your Savior, that's not true. Remember what the Bible says in First Corinthians ten thirteen. And also that there's no hope. Well, there is hope if you know Christ, your, again, if you know Christ, your Savior. Um, that through comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope um, in Romans 15, 4. Uh, remember that, de let's remember that depressed thinking slanders the character of God. It's basically, you're, when, you de when you're in a depressed state and you continue to remain in such a state, that the depressed thinking slanders the character of God. You're basically saying that God is not good. Or you're saying, God may be good to you, but God is not good to me. And, at, and to remain in that state, it can be, a, it can be sinful um, to remain in a state of depression. God, is, God's will, God, has an, God has a great and exciting will for your life, Christian. And you can overcome by his grit, by and through his grace, you can overcome depression. I want to look today at the example of Saul in, in, a, in, a, in a little alliterative way. I've entitled today's message, Saul's Sad State. It's how Saul failed to overcome depression. Saul's Sad State. And if you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 9, give me a second to get there myself. 1 Samuel 9. Actually, start in chapter 8. My apologies. Um, again, a lot, of, a lot of the text, we're going to be skipping over a lot, uh, large portions of text just for time's sake. But if you would read the majority of at least 1 Samuel chapter 8 through about 1 Samuel 15, and then bits and pieces of chapters 16 through about 30. That's where the entirety of Saul's life is going to be concerned. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Good morning. Um, I want to see, first off, Saul's small start. Saul's small start. Yeah, I had to work really hard to get that one. Somebody can tell. I want to note, first of all, that the people wanted a king. Let's start with uh, chapter 8, verse number 1. Uh, we're picking up the scene kind of a little bit, a little early before Saul enters the scene. And the people of Israel have had judges for the last number of years. A judge would reign 20 years, 40 years, and so on. Um, judging to do good in, in, in God's sight, or, or most, of the, most of them did good in, in God's sight. But then after a judge would die, then the people would fall into sin. Then another God would raise another judge. They'd get right. The land would have rest. The cycle would go, and the vicious cycle would continue on and on. By the time we get into 1 Samuel, we see, though, that uh, the people are wanting a king. Uh, chapter 8, verse number 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second Abiah, they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. That's where Samuel would hold his main court, the city of Ramah. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king 
to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto thy voice, their voice, how be it, yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. We'll stop right there. The people wanted a king. Not judge, they didn't want judges anymore. It was basically like saying, instead of God judging us using these judges, we want a king to judge over us. I want to note that their reason for wanting a king, verse 6, and you could also see in verse 20, that we may also be, may be like the, all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us and fight our battles. That they wanted to be like the nations around them. Why? Why do they really want the nations around them? To, why do they really want to be like all the nations around them? Were all the other nations worshipping false gods and doing evil in God's sight? Why would Israel want to be like them? They didn't want God to. They didn't want to. They didn't want. To, they didn't want God to reign over them. They didn't want. They didn't want God. They're rejecting God as king, essentially. They wanted a humanly king to reign over them. This is a verse seven. Since they reject, they didn't, they, he was saying to Samuel, they not rejected. They not reject. They didn't reject Samuel. <clears throat> they were rejecting, rejecting God. And that's what happens when they. And that's what happens when people reject authority. In reality. You may be, you may think you're just rejecting your boss, but in reality, you're rejecting God. You're saying, I, we will not have this man to reign over us. They wanted to be like the nations around them. Keep your finger here in 1 Samuel, but turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17. This is just kind of a little side note. We'll be getting back to Saul very, very shortly. Uh, verse, chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, verse 14. Moses speaking, uh, Moses speaking here and God saying to Moses, uh, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Now back to 1 Samuel. Basically, that, that passage in Deuteronomy is foreseeing or foretelling this very event, which would happen about 300 or so years later, give or take, this idea here that the people no longer wanted judges, but they wanted a king to judge over them. It would later, of course, set the scene for Christ to come and be king. But here, why they wanted a king, not exactly what they should have been asking for. All right, over to chapter 9. Now let's, uh, let's look at Saul. Saul's going to enter the scene here. Uh, verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. He was a tall man. Saul is a son of Kish, so he's of the uh, Benjamin tribe. In verse 16, let's read, let's go to verse 15, sorry. Now the Lord had come, told Samuel in his ear, a day before Saul came. He, he basically, is, uh, God's going to prepare Samuel to receive Saul. 
The Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, verse 16, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord spake, said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. Note here, God readies Samuel for Saul's arrival. He's basically telling the elder judge, this is the man whom, we will, whom you are to set king over this land, over my people. Saul has a, it, it starts out small in his own eyes. Note verse 21. When Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? In my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? He's showing some humility in verse 21. Perhaps Saul is de declaring, he's like, who am I? Who am I to judge this people? Who am I to reign over them? Am I not of the smallest tribe? He's basically declaring, he's almost pulling a Moses, so to speak. Remember when Moses was at the burning bush and he declared himself to be, you know, know. slow, of a slow tongue, slow, speech, slow in speech? He had the best training of any Hebrew. Certainly Moses was raised up for that occasion. Why could not Saul? Perhaps Saul, Saul wanted to be seen here, perhaps, as just... Just a mere man, and not so as the man whom God was going to use to lead his people in this for a time. Now, we're going to see here that Saul is going to be anointed and um, temporarily empowered with the Spirit. Uh, chapter 10, verse 1 to start. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Verse 5. Sorry, verse 6. Skipping a little bit of the, of the scene here. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Let me explain something. When God is with you, are you capable of doing anything and everything for him? Absolutely. What does he need another man there? Basically, I think I think the context here is that that basically he's Saul Saul doesn't want to be different in his own eyes. But when he's going to be empowered with the spirit, he's going to turn, he's basically going to be another man. Like he's saying, he's it's going to be, he's going to act like a totally different person when he's empowered. And in kind of almost the same context, aren't we another man when God's completely working in us and through us, as opposed to not when God's not working in us and through us, but maybe when we're feeling we're totally different when we're in a depressed state or a downstate than when God's working in our lives and the and his spirit is working in and through us. For those of you that are uh, walking in behind, we are looking at the example of Saul this morning and the and how Saul battled depression and would ultimately fail in a message I've entitled Saul's Sad State. But we're looking at first at Saul's small start and we are in 1 Samuel chapter number 10. He's going to be, Saul is going to be temporarily empowered with the Spirit. Remember, Pete, in the Old Testament, the Spirit was a temporary empowerment that as 
prophets or people walked with God, they would be temporarily empowered for his usage, and then the spirit would go away. Whereas we are permanently, whereas now, now because we've had, because we know Christ is our Savior, because Christ died and gave, and gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit permanently indwells the life of a believer now. So it worked just a, worked just a little bit differently in the Old Testament. Let's look down to um, Saul's confirmation. So let's go down to chapter 10 and verse number 19. Actually, 17 for context. The Bible says, And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpah, and said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all kingdoms, and of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversaries, adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said to him, unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul the son of Kish was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further if a man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. Perhaps a little bit of more humility on the part of Saul, that he would go and... He knew that at this point, God was gonna that God that he was the man. He was that God was gonna use him, and perhaps in this moment, feeling small in his own eyes, he ran and hid. Verse twenty three. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. We'll stop there. So he's going to be empowered with the spirit temporarily here now, with the spirit of the Lord, as a sign that God is with him. And now here he, we see his confirmation. So first this morning we saw Saul's small start. Now I want to see Saul's sinful slide. Chapters 11 and 12 are something that is a good text to read on your own time. We're not going to be going over any passages in these two chapters in detail this morning. But basically, chapter 11 is basically one of Saul's early actions as king, uh, delivering God's people. And another confirmation by Samuel of Saul in chapter 12, that as Samuel is getting older and is starting to lose it a little bit, so to speak, that more, a lot more of the, tra of the power is going to be transferred from the elder judge Samuel unto King Saul. I want to go to chapter 13 now, because I want to, now I want to see Saul's sinful slide. When the king saw the people gather in battle with the Philistines, Saul would look for Samuel Let's start in verse number one for Saul, verse number two of chapter thirteen for context. Saul chose him three thousand men of Israel, whereof two thousand were with Saul at Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard Saul that sa say that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. Note verse 5. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as a sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from beth -Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, that they were in trouble, 
for the people were distressed. Now the people are discouraged. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan, the river, to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. Let's stop right there. Note how it says that Saul was supposed to tarry seven days, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. We haven't read that yet. Let's go back to chapter 10. Keep your finger in chapter 13, but let's go back to chapter 10. I want to note chapter 10, and I want to note verse 8 in particular. Here Samuel tells Saul, And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. And behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. Back to chapter 13 and verse number 8. So he tarries seven days waiting for Samuel to come. Note what it says, but Samuel came not to Gilgal and the people were scattered from him. Saul here is probably in a panic. He's saying, Samuel said he was going to be here after seven days. It's been seven days. He's not here. Where is Samuel? Saul's going to take it upon himself to do something he shouldn't. Let's read on. And Saul said, verse uh, 9, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him or greet him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Why did Samuel? Why did Saul feel the need to offer a burnt offering? Anybody want to conjecture? He, he, was being, he claims he was basically painted into a corner. Okay, he felt like he felt like his back was up against the wall. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, you can certainly see that. Anybody yeah, else want to check? a few minutes for Samuel. Sure, but why would you want to wait? Uh, sure, but why would you want to give the enemy more time to uh, to encroach closer when time's running out? I guess not. It's. I mean, certainly, it's, it's certainly a thought. Anybody else? You have a big smile on your face. Go ahead. Well, that's a number of things. One. He knows he's not qualified for it, but he's like, well, I'm the man, so I need to... Take charge? Yeah, I need to take charge and do something. Yeah, he certainly could have felt... He certainly felt Samuel's not going to show up. I'm going to... You know, it's on me. Maybe for all he knows, Samuel's dead. Maybe the Philistines had slain Samuel. You had a thought? Just what you said. Okay, that's it. All right, so you were just, you were just going to agree with that. Yeah, basically, maybe maybe he thinks maybe he thinks Samuel's dead, even though it's not conjectured here in scripture. Maybe he thinks Samuel's dead. Maybe he thinks he's not gonna come. They're coming up quick. I've not offered supplication on the Lord here. Let me just offer this up real quick. And there's no, there's not gonna be any harm by it. Oh, but there's great harm in this. So I, I think Charlotte's first point that Saul was thinking more highly of himself, because even if. If he recognized that this is his place to do this, even if he knew Samuel was dead, even if he knew for a fact that he was dead, knowing it wasn't his place, it still wasn't his place. Yeah. And so, you know, he's thinking more highly of himself than he ought. To think. Sure. Yeah. I mean, when you're when you're when you're in a high position, there is a ten. There's always a tendency 
to think about think of yourself in a place higher than you ought to be, and that's that's a good and that's a kind of a good reminder to a, to Christians that are in higher places of authority, perhaps in their more, more certainly in their workplace, but there's other things that it could apply. Um, just because you're in that high place, there are still people and account and, and things that are above your reach. And just because you have reach over a few more things doesn't give you reach into those other things. Basically, this was this was out of place for Saul, even if Samuel was dead. Saul did not need to offer the burnt offering. There's no reason for him to. Verse 13. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Samuel came to Gilgal after seven days. Samuel was supposed to come to Gilgal after seven days and offer the burnt offerings and give direction. But when Saul took on himself the necessity to force the burnt offering, Saul was going to lose a very valuable opportunity. When Christians take on God's responsibilities for themselves, that ultimately is going to cause depression. That's going to cause us some grief in our lives because we're taking on a something that we can't handle. God gives us enough to handle. We've got our own problems in our lives and we don't necessarily need more the more you've got going on you the more you're going to feel the more you're potentially going to feel down get discouraged and fall into a state of depression the Saul slide's going to continue in chapter 14 when he makes a we're not going to read it for time in chapter 14 when he's going to see that He's going to make a bad decision in what I feel, what I felt, what, what, what seems to me like an unnecessary decision to refuse the people to eat in a, uh, in, a bat, in, a Philistine, in a battle with the Philistines. But I want to focus further on a further dissension of Saul when he refused to slay Amalek completely, sparing the life of Agag. Turn me to chapter 15. Let's read verse 1 of 1 Samuel 15. And we'll, go, we'll read a, a number of verses here. The Bible says, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the, of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them and tell him 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay wait in a valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, Amalekites probably, lest I destroy you with them. For he showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah, unto thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Note verse 9, though. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, 
and of the oxen, and of the fans, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Was this complete? Did Saul officially complete the task that God, through Samuel, had? No. No. What did God say? Verse 3. Now go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare not, and spare them not, but slay, and so on and so forth. Were there any exceptions? Do I read any exception in chapter, in chapter 15 of verse number 3? I do not. I certainly hope you do not. So why in verse 9... Is Saul sparing Agag, the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the lambs, the fatlings, all that was good and would not utterly destroy them? Why? Why is he not fulfilling the word, the word of the Lord? Pride. Pride? You got a phone? Yeah, it, he, he said it better, though. They're basically... He, he wouldn't say this, but he, he thinks he's, he knows better than God does. Who is man to think that they know better than God? That's, that's a rhetorical question. You know, man, man, man certainly cannot think that. Saul is full of himself. And he's, so he's not going to... He's not going to hearken under the, the voice of Samuel, let alone the voice of God. God here finally has to reject Saul, the anointed one. Verse, no, verse number 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, he was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set, up him, see, he set him up a place, and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou, the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth that in this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears? And the lowing of the oxen, which I hear. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, the sacrifice of the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. And Saul said, 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, Wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? Verse 19. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have destroyed the Amalekites. Verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. It's better to obey the voice of God than to offer offerings. That's basically what he says. Basically what he is saying, if you're not going to come to me with a, you're not going to have the right heart, I can't use you. Finally, I want to see this morning, we're running low on time, Saul's sad state. We saw his small start, his sinful slide, and now I want to see his sad state. Chapter 16. Let's we'll start reading right away in verse number 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. This is after God's gonna, uh, Samuel is going to... Hear, hear from God that he is going to anoint, that uh, David is going to come and be the, the Saul's successor. An evil, here an evil spirit is going to trouble the former king. Now, 
date so when Saul would um, when this would happen Saul would seek for music and David would come and play for him and Saul would be uh, revived and the spirit would no longer trouble him but after Israel exalted David chapter number 18 let's read verses 5 to 9 here the Bible says, And David went out with whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, this would be referring to chapter 17 where he had slayed uh, Goliath, that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments and music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. This set Saul off. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And, they have, and he said, This they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. And it came to pass in the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the middle of the house, in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as other time, at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And, small, and Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. When God had started the transition of power from Saul to David, and the people were exalting David because of what he had done with the in the in the, in the great victory that God gave them gave him over Goliath and the Philistines, and they ascribed David with much more glory and exaltation than him and what he had done, that set him off. He was no longer he was no longer. He was now sm smitten with anger against David. The next, from chapters 18 on to about chapter 30, there's going to be a number of instances of Saul and da uh, Saul going after David and trying to slay him. David would, would go and, and spare him at times. Then Saul would repent, but then get angry again. And just the vicious and a vicious cycle of depression continued. Finally, I want to see the end of Saul's life, chapter thirty-one, and this is the final passage we'll be reading this morning. Chapter thirty-one. Let's read it, beginning in verse one. Here the Bible says, "Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines, and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa." And the Philistines followed hard against Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him. And he was sore wounded of the archers. So here Saul is going to take a, um, a wounding. He's going he's gonna to be hit, but not fatally. Then Saul, said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. He's basically asking his armor bearer to kill him. Saul's, state, Saul's sad state had gotten so low that even in a wounding, that he, he had enough. He's asking his armor bearer to kill him. His armor bearer couldn't stay, wouldn't do it. So therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he likewise fell upon, upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men that same day together. Finally, in this last in another battle with the Philistines, Saul is wounded and asked for someone to kill him. And when we saw here that when he refused, that he fell on the sword himself, that the army and the armor bearer would also fall upon the sword. Had Saul, it early on, just 
just said, you know what, I've done wrong. And he just humbled himself. He said, I've done wrong. I've got myself into this state. I've rejected God, but I'm going to let David work. Had he just let David work? Had he just let David become king and kind of gotten back to that small state wherein God was using him and glorifying him? God still could have used him and glorified God could still have used Saul. God could have still used Saul. David probably would have come back and spared him. I mean, certainly, you would certainly think David, David had a lot of respect for Saul, even in times that Saul was seeking his life. David still had great respect for him and still sought as such that he would have spared Saul. But ultimately, a wrong response to depression not only drags you down, but drags others down with you. Does anybody have any questions? No? Okay, next week we are going to look at the example of David and see where that David's going to have a different outcome in dealing with depression. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look in your word this morning and see the example of Saul. Lord, help us to realize, help us to be always small in our own eyes and to humble ourselves before you, that you would use us, that we would hearken unto your word, that we would do all that you would have for our lives and help us not to get in a state of depression that we wouldn't take other, that we would not only not ourselves not fall, but Lord, that we wouldn't drag others with us. Lord, I do pray for the service to come that you would be honored and glorified in what is taught from your word and help us to grow. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. <coughs>